have an amazing kids ministry here. Um, so I ventured back um, and interacted with everyone. And then all of a sudden, I felt this pat on my back. And then a girl came up and said, or put this on me, which it says, hug me, right? Hug me. So that's really, really cool. And um, after about the third or fourth hug I received, I maybe thought I should look on the back and see what was going on. <laughs> and that's what it was. So we recovered from Easter, have we not? Have you eaten all the Easter eggs? Yes. All right. Um, how many of y'all, um, can, we, can we do the lights a little bit more? It's just my eyesight is horrible. So if we can up the lights a little bit more. Um, there we go. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. There. Awesome. Okay. Now, um, how many took candy from your kids? All right. All right. Good job. Good job. Um, why? Why did you do that? What excuse did you give? What's that? Dad tax. Right. Okay. What is the dad tax today? Oh, okay. There's specific tax. Okay. I get it. Um, I don't know. I was out of candy um, in my office, and I don't know who came through, but now I have ring pops. I have the best gum of all. This gum, what gum is this? The bubble, double, bubble, whatever. Um, I love that gum. It's worth fighting for. I don't know where that came from. But my office remains unlocked for all time. So if you want to put stuff in there, there is a camera that will show who's stealing. No, I'm just joking. Um, so we're doing this series, He's Alive Now What? We're going we're gonna to talk about this for the next four weeks, all right? He's Alive Now What? Um, I, I like the... I like looking into what's going on in the scriptures. Um, I love stories. I love the engagement. I love the interaction with Jesus. And I, th I think we get to learn a lot about what he does when there are specific times in his life before something happens. For example, looking at what Jesus interacted, how he interacted, and how he engaged with folks before the week before, the Holy Week, right, the Passion Week. And then we have this interaction of 40 days before he takes off, we have an interaction again. And, and I think as followers of Jesus, these are some important times that we can look how Jesus, God, engages with us in moments that we have similar trials than the disciples as those people back then. So I want to start with this. I want to start with this this morning. I have a chair. Okay, I have a chair. Now you're like, thanks, John, that's wonderful. Um, a lot of times in our life, this is an important part that maybe we do not understand. And this is what I mean by that. We have situations that occur in our life. Engagements in the sense of interactions and all these things, but we have a chair. And it's interesting who we place in these chairs. We place someone, and it, and it usually is from our past or sometimes could be in our present, but this chair does a lot of talking to you and I. This chair makes comments when we have certain failures. This chair makes certain judgments when we even succeed. But this chair is a very important part of our life. And depending on who we put in the chair determines how we interact and act with other people. Now, parents. Sometimes we put a parent in the chair. Um, my wife grew up with a, a dad that was very, very um, judgmental, strict. Um, and if Christy made a 100, why didn't you make a 101? And so I've seen through my life that in her particular interactions and in, in situations, she always feels like she can do better. And what we have to be very careful of as parents 
And she does a good job at this. But what we receive, we do what? We pass on. And so sometimes we have a parent that sits in this chair. At other times, we have a spouse that sits in this chair. And this is ideally a lot easier than I thought it would be. Always in my head. But we have a spouse that sits in this chair. Maybe the spouse is critical. Maybe the spouse, I'll even go this way. Maybe the spouse is perfect. And maybe the spouse, in some ways, brings you some security and encouragement, as they should. But there are moments when your spouse sits in this chair, man, it's heavy, and you're battling them. Maybe it's something you did yesterday. Maybe it's a mistake, a sin, or whatever it may be that, that you have, have done against your spouse, which we all have, but it seems as if it's hard to overcome that mistake or that sin. And then we go a little bit deeper, and this can be boyfriend, girlfriends, husbands, wives, whatever it may be, but we have an ex. We have some type of ex in our life that is continuing to speak to us. They're continuing to tell us things about us, even when they may not be present. But they're helping us see how we failed. They're helping us see how we didn't make it. They're helping us see. We run everything through the chair, through the spouse, through the parent, through the ex. But we also run it through success. Sometimes God has allowed us to find some level of success, and we run everything through that success. Christy and I did that um, with the house of Moses. There's a part of me, maybe not Christy, but there was a part of me after doing what we were able to do in Haiti and see what the success that God had in it. Um, how, do you ever, how do you ever follow that up? And so some of us have success in the chair, a, a past success. And, and what that does is that keeps us frozen in the tomorrow of our life and, and many times keeps us frozen in the present of our life. Because how can I do any better? How can I ever achieve that next trophy? How can I ever make my parents as proud of me as they were when I did whatever, and then we have failure, failure. We have situations that occur in our life called failure, and they haunt us because every one of us has a chair in our life, and that chair contains something. The chair never sits empty, never does. It's comparison of the pillow at night. When you lay your head on your pillow at night, the pillow talk, your mind talking to you. But this is a tangible way of saying what is in your life speaking to you. One of the things we do, and I do a lot, is I ask this question. If you'll put that question up there. It says this, what would Jesus say to you if he walked into the room and sat beside you? What would Jesus say to you if he walked into the room and sat beside you? What if you, you were in your, 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 your most difficult part of life, and man, you have messed up. You know you've messed up. You know you have made some mistakes. What would Jesus say? What would be the first thing he would say, now some of us as followers of Christ, here's, here's even a more damaging approach to this. Some would say he wouldn't even come in. He would just not show up. Why? Because you based your ideas on the chair based upon who showed or didn't show up in the past. For some of us, we wonder if Jesus would even show up based upon things we have done. Others would say, yes, he would show up, 
he wouldn't say a thing, but he'd be watching his watch, waiting for us to engage with him, because after all, he's perfect and we're not. Still yet, we have some that would sit in, or we would say Jesus would sit in this chair. And I, and I see this a lot in the interactions of, of couples and marriage counseling. I'd be like, okay, whatever, whatever person has more blame, whatever that may be, I'd say, okay, if Jesus walked in the door and sat beside you right now, what would be the first thing he would say? And sometimes I hear this, try harder. I can't believe you did what you did with what I gave you. And you hear these things, and, and sooner or later, you begin to see the echoes and the noise in our head have no accurate description of who Jesus says he is. And so today, we're going to be looking at, all right, he's alive, now what? And we're going to look at a situation where he engages. He comes in. He doesn't sit down, but he comes in and interacts with some folks, some folks he knows. And so as we begin, I want to ask this question, am I facing any fears in my life? What are some unknowns? What are some fears that you may be facing in your life? What are some unknowns? Maybe, maybe they're your fault. Maybe you placed yourself in that situation. Or maybe they're things that you have no control over, but it causes turmoil. It causes this lack of peace in your life. My question is this, how does Jesus respond to the fears? Because in that, it does make a difference how we view because that's how we're going to walk. How we start the day, how we interact within the day with whoever we sit in, sit in the chair is how we're going to walk, how we're going to engage in the everyday portion of our life. I love my kids. I love my kids. I had the opportunity to see a miracle happen this past Thursday. Ava received her driver's license. Right? Right? <laughs> Now, there was, a, there was a mom in her life or a wife in my life that, oh, ye have little faith uh, about Ava receiving her driver's license. But we worked on it. There were opportunities on a farm-to-market road where we were passing milk trucks going 80 miles an hour. And for a fraction of my life, I didn't know what would happen. Had no clue. Everything went well. And so then we showed up on Thursday, took the driving test. She passed it. And through that, through that process, it was beautiful to see her fear, because there was, <laughs> the engagement that we had. And I love that. There wasn't a shutdown. There wasn't a, 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 a Ava's not the, great, the biggest talker, right? But she would not be quiet on Thursday going towards her test. Why? Because there were some things in her life that she didn't know. There was fear. And, and so, not that I get it right all the time by any means, but there was an engagement with me. Now, let's ask this, because we all have fears, don't we? What are your fears? Did you know there's over 500 phobias? And you, you know what, guys, I have matured. I know it's, it's questionable for some of you, but I wanted to put some of these things, pictures up there. And before we get to that one, there are some other phobias out there. Did you know there's a phobophobia? Do you know what a phobophobia is? A fear of fears. <laughs> How about this one? This is great. Look, uh, Iraqi butrophobia. Iraqi butrophobia. Butro, you don't, you don't look it up anyway. It doesn't matter. What is that? Fear of chickens. My wife loves chickens. Um, how about this one? Um, actually, no, that was, I'm, I'm sorry. Iraqi butrophobia is the fear of getting peanut butter stuck to the top of your mouth. Anybody have that fear? Okay, uh, it exists. Um, if you're a student in this room, just go to your teachers on um, Tuesday and say, hey, would have loved to have done the, uh, the, uh, the, the homework, but I have this, this butro, what is it, acrobutrophobia, and uh, it's just taking control of my life. 
and see what happens. No. <laughs> but electrophobia, electorophobia is the fear of chickens. And it's horrible, Christy, I know. So we need to sell all of our chickens because we want our place to be a place of peace and not phobia, all right? But these are some of the top phobias. Acrophobia is the fear of heights, and it affects more than 6% of people. Anybody have the fear of heights in this room today? Okay, yes. I don't have a fear of heights as much as I have a fear of falling from those heights. Um, and then you have the aerophobia. Anybody have the fear of flying? Which I'm assuming if you have the fear of heights like I do, you have the fear of flying, right? There's no reason that a plane should be in the air. But for those that have that fear, there are some amazing podcasts that deal with all the plane crashes that have ever happened, and you can listen to them. And it helps you. It really does help you. Um, that's what I do at night. Maybe that's why I cannot sleep. Arachnophobia. Anybody have the fear of spiders? Okay. I was going to put a spider on the screen, but I thought, that's evil. <laughs> that, that is evil. But I wanted to. I wanted to. So there are some fears, but then there are also a three common other fears. They're not the top, but they, are, they, they do circle around up there. Number one, the fear of failure. Number two, the fear of not being a good enough and the fear of disappointing others. And then we come back to the chair, right? The fear of failure, the fear of not being a good, good enough, and the fear of disappointing others. You're going to see today, we're going to get through it quickly, but you're going to see today how Jesus engages and interacts with his children, even those that may not be his children, how he, how he, what he does when he sits in the chair. And I want to start by saying this. This happens on the day of resurrection, all right? This this, this happens. Now, setting it up, I'm not going to read these, but we are told of five appearances. Five appearances of Jesus. Number one, to Mary Magdalene. To number two, the other women. The road, the two on the road to Emmaus, Peter, and the ten disciples. Thomas not being there. We'll talk about him next week. But all of those engagements. So, so think about this. You have, <laughs> you have, you have the opportunity to see Jesus. You know he's there. You know he's alive. He's no longer dead. He, he's risen from the grave. He's conquered the grave. All that's happened. But then we have a moment that occurs that it seems like they almost forget about who Jesus was and who Jesus is. Don't we do that? Let me read the scripture in John chapter 20 and 19 and 21. It says that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors, behind locked doors, because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Okay, following Jesus, Jesus died, they saw it, he was put in a tomb, and now he's walking around, and they're still afraid? Are you kidding me? Are, are, are you kidding me? Why, why are they afraid? Suddenly, suddenly, I love it, suddenly Jesus was standing there among them, boom, right? which is awesome. How did it happen? I don't know. Did he walk through the wall? I have no idea. One of the things we can take from this, because there's no accidents in Scripture, that tells us a little bit about our post-resurrected body. It, it just does things different. So those who like Avengers, potentially coming one day, all right? Now, look at this. What does he say? Peace be with you. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and the side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Now, again, five times they had seen him. Five times. When you're reading a scripture, when you're reading a passage like this, there's some questions you can ask yourself. When, where, what, why, and how? When was it? Resurrection day. What was going on? Or where? In, the, in this locked upper room. What? They were afraid. Why? The Jewish leaders. And how? Who, what, when, where, why, how? You can put that to any passage and you can learn a lot from it. This is what I also put to me and then I put question marks. How does it, what does it speak to me in my life? So, Let's look at this quickly. 
Number one, in your fear, in your unknowns, Jesus, right here, sits right here. This is what he does. Number one, Jesus is present even in my fears. He's present. He's engaged. What does that tell you? He's sitting with you. Jesus is in the chair. He's in the room. He's not the parent or the spouse or the ex or whatever it may be that when times, when get, when times get tough, they, 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 they exit. Or when times get tough, maybe they avoid. Or maybe when times get tough, they don't know how to interact. Jesus is engaged with you. He's not leaving. Look at this scripture. Again, look at this. It says this. It says, he, again, he said what? What is the first thing he says? Peace. Peace. And, and, and some of us would say that, or actually, I'm sorry, that Sunday the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid, and, and suddenly Jesus was standing there. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Jesus was standing there, what? Amongst them. Jesus was standing amongst them. And this is what I love about Jesus. He's always standing before he's speaking. <laughs> he's, always ask, or he's always there for water before he talks to the woman. Jesus is good about being present. Jesus is good about being present, but look at this. Even in my fears, he's there. So if you're a follower of Christ today and you're like, man, I'm going through some unknowns. I'm going through some lack of faith. I'm going through some doubts. I'm going through some unknowns, and I don't know where Jesus is. He's there. He's in the chair. He's right there with you. Because here's the idea of this all, guys. This is the idea. Jesus gets nothing from us. We get everything from him. Only those who exit. And guess what, right? Even I do this when Christy and I are engaging in our conflict. Even though we know how to go through conflict, we, we are masters of helping others conflict well. When we go through conflict, sometimes I walk out, I'm just the worst husband in the history of husbandry. And Christy's like, you're a three-year-old. <laughs> and I'm like, you make good choices marrying a three-year-old. What does that say about you? Not all the time, but I do think it. So see, husbands, when you act like a three-year-old, you can turn it back on them because they're the ones that married you. <laughs> all right. Now, here we go. So, so I don't stay, but Jesus stays. Number two, I don't know which one it is. Okay, Jesus speaks to where we are. And what do you mean by that? It's see, we don't do that, do we? I don't do that as a parent. I don't always do that as a spouse. I don't, I don't do that as a friend. I, I make judgments, or I, 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 I have these ideas of not, of not where they are, but where they what? Should be. I, I'm, I'm not about where they are, but where they should be. And what does that tell you about yourself? Let's do some psychoanalysis. If you're always telling people where they should be instead of speaking to where they are, what does that say about you? It's not about them. It's about you. Why is Jesus able to say, peace be with you? Because of this. This is what's going on. The God of all creation has no insecurities. The reason you and I sometimes are not present or don't, we don't speak where people are, we speak where they should be. And there are times that we do, should, and we do that, and we should speak to where they should be. I'm not saying you could, shouldn't, but you got to remember, you also got to speak to where they are. Recognize where they are because it's, in, it's where they are that there's a, there's a healing that can occur. There's a healing that can go on and, and you can experience with them. What? You're going to have tough times sometimes. You're going to go through some difficulties sometimes. Look at this. He speaks to where we are. And what, what do you mean, John? This is what I mean. He didn't come in and he said, where were you guys? Are you kidding? Five times. My father and I had this discussion. He said four. I was like, you should live with them. They need five. Four is good. No, five. And I did the five. And you still screwed up. No. He didn't do that. He didn't. He just shows up and he says what? This is the hippie Jesus. Peace. Right? But he says peace. And what does that word mean? It means not so much 
the problem leaving. But you know when peace sits here? You know when everything in the world can be going wrong, but you're like, it's, al it's almost like you're half like psychotic. Um, but you're not. You're spirit-filled. Um, there's it's a gray area. <laughs> but when you're facing things that should be setting you off, and you're just like, <laughs> all right, God's in control. And, and that's what he wants you to hear. Why? Why does he speak to where they are first? Because he knows that if he doesn't, it's not going to help him as he continues to say what he's got to say. We lose our voice sometimes, don't we? Speaking to where people should be instead of where they are. Number three, this is so stinking powerful. His purpose doesn't change five times. He appears to him five times. All the disciples, everyone in that room mostly saw him. And they were hiding from the Jewish leaders. And Jesus shows up, speaks to where they are. Um, his purpose doesn't change. Look at this. Again, he says, peace be with you as the Father has sent me. What? Oh, my gosh. Are you, are you kidding me? Man, he must have been desperate for people to serve and hold doors because he'd take anyone, right? No. He continues the calling. Because guess what? Everyone is a, everyone has a purpose. In church today, we've made this person, and I'm sorry, whew, um, you made this person that. And I'm not. I'm not. We had men's breakfast yesterday, and I, and I met some people. Um, I met a guy, and, and the way that he got to the men's breakfast, it wasn't because Dude, I heard on YouTube you speak, and it was dynamic. Nope. <laughs> he says, hey, I moved here. These friends reached out to me, and, and you know what? They asked me to come and be a part, and I'm a part. You have a purpose. And, and can I just be completely honest again? <sighs> you have a great purpose and engagement. That sometimes I will never have. Because I walk into the room, this is what you do. This is my pastor. Okay. Right? First of all, he doesn't look like one. Um, secondly, I've heard about you before. You're one of those guys. You have a purpose. Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Can we go back to the main passage real quick, real fast? I want to show you this too. Jesus is so amazing. Look at this. Verse 20, I didn't bring this out, but I wanted to bring it out. As he spoke, what did he do? <laughs> he showed him his what? His wounds. His wounds. Because some of us have this idea sometimes that Jesus would never do that. Maybe the wounds that day meant this. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot. Hey, Peter, just joking. <laughs> um, but his wounds. Guys, guys, remember, I told you it was going to get tough before it got better. I, I told you. And, and it's, it's going to be okay. So, so what about us? When, when we speak to others, do we show our wounds? Do we show what it is? Do we show the difficulty? This last week at TRC has been a, a difficult week for us. It just has. I'm not going to go into details. If you want, you can, um, you can look on social media. We've blasted it on there. No, I'm joking. Um, but it was just, it's just stuff that comes up. And we had some uncomfortable conversations. We did. But you know what? In those com uncomfortable conversations, there was so much beauty. Because we learned to see, hey, we all have wounds. 
we all have things. We all, we, we all have junk. We all have a past. We all have insecurities. But to see us journey through some things that wasn't pretty at one point, what do you think that does for this team? It builds what? Strength and what else? Trust. And I love those things. I, lo- I don't like to go through them, <laughs> but I love that for a team. Wounds, wounds. Now, we're almost finished. Look at this. This is so exciting. Okay, I know you cannot wait. You're like, I cannot wait. I hear you, okay? Up front, again, let's go back and question ourselves. Am I facing any fears in my life today? How does Jesus respond to the fears? How does he respond to them? Again, he shows up. He speaks to where we are, and his purpose doesn't change. So if you're hearing any other voice, I don't care if they're wearing a black shirt or not. I I don't care if you're hearing any other voice. God still has a purpose for you, right? Now, look at this, too, because I want to continue. Think about it. How does knowing his response to my fears change my outlook today? Because, see, here's the thing. Jesus wants you to go and live this out this week. First place is where? Where's the first place you need to live it out? Home, right? So so look at this. This is really, really cool. Look, to the one who is questioning God's existence, what? He is there. Being all-knowing? Look at this. He saw you in your locked room even before there was a room or you. (laughs) That's amazing. So you may be sitting in a room today by yourself, locked doors, no one's getting in. You're not letting anyone in, and Jesus is like, I know the combination, and I'm coming in. That's right. Has a key. And the beauty of that, he shows up so those that may be there. Number two, to the one who is doubting if God could ever love them. God is love. His love is not based upon the conditions of your best day or worst day. It is based upon no condition other than he loves you. That's it. God loves you. What do you mean? But, but he loves you. <laughs> don't, don't add clarifiers. Don't add these things to it. Don't add these things that you, you think. Because, because why? Because the people you picked up in the chair. But I, I know I have some good parents, but they love me more if. I know I have a good spouse, but they love me more if. I, I, know, <laughs> I know that I made some mess ups, but, but, and I know I'm judged by those. No, you're not. There are always consequences. But that's not who's talking to you if you're a follower of Jesus. Because we're going, keep going, look at this. It says, to the one who is stuck in a room or frozen in place by some unknown. God is present where you are and is speaking to what is going on inside as well as reminding you he is not finished with you. He is not finished with you. He's not think if he shows up some, some, sometimes he sits in some chairs and he says oh my goodness come, come here yeah those voices that you're hearing they're untrue I love you I have a purpose for you and there's some racket and noise that should go away but I know I saw you and I see you, and I see you there. Just hold on. Finally, today, I think that's where I am, yeah, there we go. Today, knowing how he meets us, does it change the way we meet others in their own unknowns? Parents, had an amazing conversation with a brother and sister up here. Um, the reason I want to engage in the brother and sister, I won't bring you up here, I promise, okay, is because I'm going through some engagement and stuff with my sister right now and some interactions and some healings over the past and pushing in and all that stuff. So anytime I see a brother and sister sitting beside each other, I want to, I want, I want to learn from that. And one of the things is knowing where he meets us, does it change the way we meet others and their unknowns? Who do you have in your life? Maybe your kids, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a friend at work, maybe who knows? Who have you not met where they were and you need to meet them where they are? Not speaking to where they should be, just speaking to where they are and then bring out the hands. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. 
I have some scars. I have some hurt. I have some pain in my life. And Jesus is enough. And I'm here. So I want to tell you this and we're done. Um, We've learned something. We're learning something every day about this church. It's like, wow, you're the pastor. You should. Well, we are. Um, one of the things that's difficult is this. It's very difficult. Like, for example, who can I pick on? Anybody? Somebody that I know. Okay, Reese, you're big. I can pick on you. Come on, man. No, I'm joking. Okay. No. But Jared said some bad things about you. He's sitting beside you. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Just joking. Let's say if Reese wants to come up here and speak to someone. First, he has to awkwardly move out of the row. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. I'm going to the bathroom, really. Really, I'm going to the bathroom. And you get to the end of the row. It's like I'm coming to the front. It's hard sometimes for some people in the middle to want to come up here and talk. But we really want to engage and talk with you. Why? Because we learn from you. <laughs> it's not selfish in the sense of us just wanting to help you because we have it all figured out. We don't. But we want to learn from you as well. And so don't, I'm going to say this, don't cheat us because we need to hear your story too. But there's going to be people up here. And if you want to come and talk to them during the song, you can, but I know that's awkward. But there's going to be people in the connections room out here. Just stay around. We want you to stay around because we know the difference Jesus makes. And we want to be reminded of that by your story. So hang out. Thank you for checking out Timber Ridge Church here on YouTube. If you would like to see a previous message, click here. If you would like to stay up to date with all things TRC, subscribe here.